Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Christopher Lane. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, I want to thank my uh, supervisor, Pedgman, for all of the good advice and encouragement that he's given me so far. Um, and I'm going to try and talk you through my research project, uh, which is testing supine breast immobilization technologies for large and pendulous breasts using a 3D printed breast phantom. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful, so I'll try to quickly take you through some of the background information on that. Um, so firstly, um, on the right, we have two pie charts uh, from uh, 2020 that represent the number of incidences uh, and mortalities of 10 of the most prevalent cancers in the world amongst women three years ago. And you can see that uh, breast cancer was by far the most commonly diagnosed cancer of those 10. And um, that's also true if you account for the most commonly diagnosed cancers in men as well of that year. Um, and it was the uh, second highest uh, mortality, I believe, and uh, was the highest of, of uh, women of that year too. Um, and so in that year alone, there was more than two and a quarter million uh, new breast cancers diagnosed and it caused more than 680,000 deaths. And it's worth noting that people who get cancer, uh, breast cancer, uh, will get it more in their left breast than off, more often than their right. And that left breast cancer is typically more aggressive and leads to worse health, health outcomes. And in Australia today, it's still uh, the second most common cancer. And it's expected to uh, have a mortality this year of about 3,300 people. Um, so how do we treat it? Um, this is going to depend on the stage that the cancer is in when it's first detected. Um, the best survival and cosmetic outcomes come if you catch it early. And then typically it's a relatively simple procedure. So a stage zero tumor will typically be removed by breast conserving surgery called a lumpectomy. And then either part or all of the breast will be irradiated uh, with external, typically external beam radiotherapy to kill any remaining cancer cells. Um, also the lymph nodes tend to be included in this as well. Um, and yes, the earlier, uh, you catch it, the better survival outcomes you have and the less treatment measures you're needed. Um, if you go beyond stage zero, uh, treatment becomes a lot more complex. And uh, this um, generally requires a full mastectomy. Um, and then you follow it up with a battery of different treatment combinations, including radiotherapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, endocrine therapy, and so on. Um, if it ever manages to reach the stage four, then a cure isn't really possible at that point and treatment is entirely palliative and palliative treatments for breast cancer can involve radiotherapy and a few others. Um, but the take home message here is that radiotherapy is used for more than half of all breast cancer treatments and of that most commonly is external beam radiotherapy. And so there are two big problems with external beam radiotherapy for breast cancer. Um, the first problem is that breasts are very close to the lungs and heart. And you can see from this CT scan, the position of the uh, treated breast um, is very close to the ipsilateral lung, which is the lung on the same side as that breast, and also to the heart as well. And that means you tend to get very high doses to the organs, to these organs, and it can lead to developing some pretty severe late tissue effects, such as pulmonary fibrosis and pneumonitis in the lungs. And it can also increase the long-term risk of heart disease as well. Um, and it can occur as late as 20 years later. Uh, the second other problem with external beam radiotherapy is acute skin toxicity. And there are several negative reactions possible, such as redness and fatigue. Um, you can also develop severe scarring, desquamation. Um, you can also develop uh, chronic lymphedema and permanent stiffness in your shoulders. Um, pretty much all patients will experience at least some reddening and swelling, um, but all of the worst tissue effects seem to happen mainly in the inframammary and axillary skin fold areas. So that's in the underside of the breasts and in the uh, area close to the armpit. And it's not entirely understood why that happens, but the sort of prevailing hypothesis is that it's a skin on skin bolus effect that's um, causing a high buildup region that's negating the skin sparing effects of mega voltage x-rays. Um, patients with uh, larger and more pendulous breasts will have uh, breasts have larger skin folds and therefore tend to suffer from more acute skin effects. Um, so a way to try and avoid problems like that is to think about how patients are positioned. There are three positions that are 
used are supine, prone, and lateral decubitus. Um, supine is the most standard of these. Um, you can see that in the in the center image um, where patients are lay are laid on their back and are either flat or on a propped up board. Um, prone patients on the left there um, are typically placed uh, on their front in either a just lying flat or in a sort of swimmer's crawl position um, with their uh, the treat the, tr the treated breast will be just hanging in an empty space on the breastboard. Um, and then you have the lateral decubitus position where the patient is sort of just laying on their side. Um, uh, and they all have their sort of drawbacks. The with supine positioning, the the, the main uh, drawback, as you can kind of see from the image, is that it, the breasts um, can deform and um, this exposes the organs to higher doses in the uh, from like beam paths. Um, you also get the skin fold effects. And so like prone position is an attempt to kind of uh, mitigate their skin fold and try to preserve the organs better. And it, it generally appears to do that, um, although you tend to have worse positioning errors. Um, the, the setup is a lot more complex and requires a lot more expertise. And you can end up with, um, like the patients are generally just, um, especially the larger breasted patients are more uncomfortable. It's very painful to be in that position for long periods of time and repeatedly. Um, and so then the, and then you have lateral decubitus, which is, it's a very rare, it's not very used very commonly at all. Um, it does seem to reduce doses to the organs and skin, but um, it has extremely large positioning errors on, I think greater than two centimeters on uh, like the, the the treatment bed can deform in that. And it's really difficult to um, treat axillary lymph nodes in that position if you can at all, really. Um, so it's not very um, good in that regard. Uh, so there's been a number of uh, workarounds to try and uh, fix uh, dose problems for large breasted patients using supine positioning. Um, uh, and that's by using some uh, breast immobilization devices. And so some of the more promising ones in recent years have been things like thermoplastic molds, where, which you can see on the, the two images on the left are examples of that. Um, and there are also um, sort of radiation support bras, like the Chebna XRT, uh, which is on the right there. And that's a, the, the rightmost image is, a, I believe, a, a CT from a, uh, from a Chebna support thing and and they, they they both are essentially are trying to do uh the same thing which is to reposition larger and more pendulous breasts in such a way that you eliminate skin folds and you sort of move the breast volume away from organs at risk during like treatment um now the actual um effectiveness of this is still somewhat ongoing there are a number of studies that have been done that don't really um uh but they usually just pilot studies there's um it seems to suggest that uh, it does reduce uh, tissue doses, at least to the lung, and it may be, um, it, it also reduces doses to the heart. Um, and also uh, it might actually increase uh, skin effects. It's not entirely clear and more testing and uh, documentation uh, needs to be done to sort of really work out what's the sort of optimal way to kind of work with these things. And so, uh, yeah, so my project uh, is going to be trying to uh, attempting to do this. And so it's going to involve attempting to make a large and pendulous uh, 3D printed uh, breast phantom so that I can uh, test some of these devices. And so I've broken my project up into three different phases. The first phase is the modeling phase. And in this one, I intend to obtain some patient CT data that is of a patient from an appropriate size breasts uh, to Get around any ethical problems i plan to sort of search through some online imaging archives to find publicly available data um, and then import that into a 3d slicer to convert that into a stereolithography file um, and then i should be able to collect breast volume contours from that and uh, the rest of the chest phantom if necessary i can grab any relevant organs at risk like the heart the lung or the spinal cord and make a tumor phantom if possible um, yeah, and then I can throw all of those into a 3D modeling program like Autodesk Fusion 360. I can 
use that to add some cavities so that I can insert some dosimeters for, for uh, later testing parts of it. I was thinking an ionization, uh, so at least for the breast phantom itself, an ionization chamber for average dose and then some uh, perpendicular slits at uh, to put some gaff chromic film in as well, potentially. Um, I was also thinking it would be good to add uh, somewhere on the chest phantom a, a screw cap and finish um, so that I could make it more easy to fill with uh, gelatin or gel uh, once the thing is printed. Um, so then that takes me to phase two, which is the printing phase. Uh, for that, I need to consider what uh, filaments I will be using. Uh, I was thinking for the organs at risk, I will need some kind of tissue equivalent PLA, like volcanic PLA for heart tissue, that sort of thing. Um, the actual phantom itself um, needs to be something less rigid than PLA, though, because um, I'm testing positioning errors and you know, breast tissue is quite soft and it's part of the reason it's positioning problems in the first place. Um, so I'm thinking something more like flex filament or uracil, if I can ob obtain that. Uh, I need to consider the printer that I'm going to be using. I figure I need a large printer for this if I'm going to be printing off large breasts and large, like a chest phantom sized objects. So I'm thinking of using the Creel TCR 10 Max printers that we have in the 3D printing workshop at Charlie's. Um, I'll also need to take some time to actually calibrate the thing to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do as well. And then I can introduce that into, uh, then I just, yeah, essentially just need to print the thing um, and make sure that it's adhering to the print bed and avoiding any warping. And these things can often take time. So I need to make sure I plan this type thing very carefully to avoid wasting you know, this this could be a big time wasting exercise if uh, if it, the printing keeps failing. So I need to be careful about these things. Um, then after it's printed, I can fill it with dosimetric gel if I have that available, or otherwise just gelatin to take it to the next phase, which is the uh, testing phase. So for the testing phase, my plan is to um, uh, source some um, appropriately sized. Uh, uh, support uh, bras. Uh, I want to grab a, a Chabner XRT radiation bra. Um, probably get some um, bras made of some simple material as well, like cotton if possible. Um, I believe there are bras that are specifically used for post treatment um, wearing as well. It would be interesting to test those as well, um, as well as like a thermoplastic mold if I can fit one for that as well. And so then the idea is to fit these to the phantom, uh, run it through a CT, and uh, try to simulate some patient posi uh, patient positioning setup scenarios to see if I can determine any positioning errors from that. Um, then afterwards, um, fit the uh, phantom with some dosimeters, um, attach some gaff chromic film to the outside to do some surface dosimetry if possible, and then run it through a uh, the Varian Truvian Linux um, and see if I can obtain some yeah, dosimetric data and compare it against the treatment planning system and see how, if I can identify any like hot spots or cold spots, or if there's any improvements or, you know, not improvements or anything. And then once I've collected all that, I intend to do some analysis, write my paper and then publish. And so then lastly, I just want to talk about the possible benefits, benefits of the project. Um, uh, the finished phantom could be used and reused anywhere throughout end-to-end -end testing on patients with similar sized breasts. It could potentially provide an accurate means of testing any future technologies or techniques, treatment planning system upgrades for breast radiotherapy. Um, it would likely be relatively cheap and quick to produce. Um, different size variants could easily be made to expand applicability to other breast shapes and sizes. And you know, at the very least, the purchased uh, immobilization devices could very likely provide new treatment setup options and improve patient comfort, modesty, and lead to better clinical outcomes. Um, yeah, and so that's my talk. Um, any any questions? Um, Great presentation there, Chris. Any questions for Chris? Roger? Uh, yes, I, I, that was a, a very nice uh, talk, Chris. I really understood it. I thought, well, at least understood it at the level that I'm capable of. Look, I've got a quick question um, yep. about the preponderance of uh, disease in the left breast. Are there any theories? Is it to do with different vasculature? Um, is it is it incorrelated with handedness in any way? 
Uh, and possibly um, uh, through handedness, uh, propensity to breastfeed more on one side. Is anything known? Um, not that I'm aware. From what I've, I mean, some of the, the only papers I could really find that really go into it are fairly old. And I think it's largely just um, like from the statistics they've collected. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure if there are any um, yeah, uh, prevailing hypotheses about that, actually. Um, I mean, I, I'm kind of thinking as far as the reason it's more aggressive or just at least has worse treatment outcomes might just be because um, it's um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the lung and like the heart is um, more asymmetrical, like favoring on that side. And so it might um, just the, the actual treatment may just be lead to worse heart disease. But yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I don't actually know um, beyond that. And I'm not sure if anyone else does. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Martin, you're raising your hand. Thanks. I'll put it down. I'll, I'll work it out. Um, <laughs> thanks, Chris. Uh, That's really, really great. Um, so if I understand correctly, there's a bit, you're going to make one phantom. Uh, and yes. then you'll, you'll have different support devices that are interchanged on that one phantom. Uh, yes, that, that is the plan. So I guess the question is, so uh, what are the differences you're expecting? Is it uh, is the phantom going to be sufficiently mobile that it'll mo uh, the different support devices will hold the breast differently? Or is it the actual material of the support that you're looking at influencing the dosimetry? What, what, what is it you're actually um, looking for? Um, yeah, so I, I, I guess a little bit of both. Um, so for the actual... Um, the actual like um because I, I think the uh some of the problem is is more to do with the way um some of these positioning errors might be due to the way the um they're actually put on the patients by um radiotherapists uh during uh like patient setup so uh, as far as that i was thinking of just um say using one of uh you know comparing individual um immobilization devices where I would um, either me, I, I think it would be good to perhaps have multiple people involved in this and to like simulate um, different, uh, you know, patients set up by different people in the same way, attempting to like uh, position a patient in the same way every time and seeing if there's variation in, in, in the results from that. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the actual, uh, Material, I think that would possibly come out in the uh, dosimetry. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not sure though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pedrin, do you want to go ahead? You've got a question. Uh, Pedrin, you have a question. Yes. Yes. It's Michelle. Hello, it's me. Um, oh, hi, <laughs> Hi. Thanks for the nice presentation. Um, Thank you. I guess um, I was going to ask one thing that was kind of Martin's question also, but I, I think um, maybe I, I say it differently. So you, you think that the the shell that you are going to produce for the to contain the gel is also flexible, that it mimics the motion of the breast in like uh, in, in practice. Yes, yeah. uh, yes, that that is the plan. So that's so that's why I, I intend to make it out of a, a more uh -huh. uh, flexible fiber rather than using a uh, rigid PLA. Um, right. I, I, yeah, so um, if I, uh, that, that, that is sort of important for what I, I want to try and do yes. at present. Okay. Yes. Okay. Because so far, all they have seen is the shells are usually hard. So we had, I don't yes. think you've ever seen. Yeah. Yes. So that's interesting. Um, yes. The other thing I wanted to ask is about your iron chamber measurement. So you, yep. you want to use the iron chamber for the, those, the, to investigate the change in those two organ as a result of immobilization? Uh, yes. Um, okay. And do you so, expect uh, to see my thing? Um, I, I honestly don't know what to expect. Um, based on stuff that I've read, I would sort of, ex um, I, I would expect there would be a, a change to the dose to organs. That's usually where there is um, from from papers I've, I've read on, uh, this is from actual just patient data. Um, there is there's usually a considerable uh, reduced dose to uh, the lung at the very least, um, 
and uh, a little bit to the heart, um, or it, it could be statistically negligible. It's sort of hard to tell um, just because there's just not, not a lot of uh, good research done on this yet. Um, so I would expect the at least the organs at risk to have to have a lower dose. Um, the skin dose, it could it could be higher. Um, yeah, that, that that is a possibility. It's but I it'd be interesting to see where and how how if it is actually improved from it. Just like you know, it'd be good to test just the without the bra itself and see if there is a, a, a marked difference there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll have time for one more quick question. Uh, John, if you want to jump ahead, go in. Yes. Thanks. Um, hi, Chris. Great presentation. I you. noticed that you mentioned potentially filling your phantom with dosimetric gel. Um, uh, yes. I'm not sure if you're aware, but the gel is quite sensitive to oxygen and inhibits it. Do you have okay. any um, ideas about how good your material is at stopping oxygen, basically, from entering inside the phantom? Um. On f at this stage, uh, no, I, 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 I don't know at all. I, I, if it is uh, sensitive to oxygen, that's definitely something I would need to consider. Um, that's, it's, yeah, it's, it's. Sorry, can I just a... check? Chris, do you mean gelatin gel or like a gel dosimeter? Uh, yeah, like, like, a, like a gel dosimeter. Okay, sorry. Um. Sorry, I'm I'm confused now. <laughs> no, um, yeah, so I I'm I'm not I I I'm not actually at this stage I'm I'm not sure um, yeah. if it's if it's even if it's even feasible. It, at this point, I'm I'm just um, considering that if it's possible, it, it would be good to use uh, dosimetry gel to get a better view of the the dose if that's possible. Um, but yeah, yeah it's, it's worth perhaps. thinking about. Yeah, perhaps try and look into the things to maybe wrap the phantom in perhaps like something with parafilm, something that won't attenuate too much. Okay. Yeah. Great. I think uh, I think we'll leave it there then. Um, well done, Chris. Fantastic presentation. Um, if you just want to stop stop sharing your screen, we'll move Thank on you. to the next one. Um, uh, Pedgman, do you normally stop, stop recording and then?